Welcome back, Shimmeru. One minute. Okay. All right, well, let me share screen. Bruno, I agree. I am happy to see familiar faces and new ones, too. Very well said. Well, let me share a screen and get us oriented. Oh, I did the thing where because I got distracted in the middle of my sentence, I forgot to introduce myself. Hello, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. Now back I'll get you. Mel, back up recording. Oh, goodness gracious. Thank you so much for supporting my executive functioning. It's going to be one of those. Recording in progress. Culture of interdependence. So, unpacking, speaking of unpacking internalized ableism. So, um, Brain Club, of course, is our uh, weekly education program to provide education about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. This is about bringing people together based on a shared vision of what's possible and contributing to systems change by shifting social norms um, through promoting new ways of thinking and being. With the idea, the idea that, that is what you ex I'm hoping that what you experience Brain Club is something you want to reproduce in the rest of your lives. And, you know, we believe that that's how systems change happens. Um, this, uh, th though, though All Brains Belong has a whole bunch of different types of programs um, uh, that do a bunch of things. This one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group or a place to kind of work through individual stuff. This is about collective education. All forms of participation are okay and welcome. You can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those other neuronormative constructs. So please feel free to walk or move or fidget or eat or stim or whatever else needs doing. And you are welcome to communicate however you are most comfortable. Um, you can and unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. Um, you can also send private messages or direct messages to me if you'd like to make a question or comment that way. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, in order to make this experience safe for all participants, we do prioritize the group's needs over that of the individual. And one of the ways that we do that is we tread cautiously around sensitive topics. Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to actually open the chat box so that I'll see it. Oh, look, so many chat messages. Hello, everybody. Speaking of the chat, chat um, sometimes, sometimes we have conflicting access needs in the chat. Um, conflicting access needs in that um, uh, when two people have needs that are mutually exclusive. And so the chat is one of those things. For many of our community members, it is a way of accessing this program um, that is really very important to be able to communicate without mouth words, um, to have more processing time, to be able to get your ideas out without the burden of working memory. It's also a, a way of, of um, engaging directly with one another. And for other community members, um, the chat can be really distracting and um, often even a startle response when the chat pops up, especially when it moves really quickly. So some ideas we have about navigating conflicting access needs. I'm gonna sneeze, hold on. Um, if you're someone who the chat box bothers you, 
um, try not closing the window, even though that's like counterintuitive. Try not closing it so that so that it doesn't keep popping. It'll just stay up, and a lot of times that is less of a startle. You can also try disabling chat preview by clicking on the little up carrot next to the chat box where the word show chat previews will pop up with a checkbox. If you tap on that or click on that, make the checkbox go away and now it should stop popping up. Okay, so here we go, it is May. It is May, new month, new theme. This whole month, we will be unpacking internalized ableism together, a very important topic. Um, before we begin, I do want to thank our Brain Club supporters um, who allow us to compensate our panelists for sharing their lived expertise with us uh, throughout the month. And uh, you are what make, makes Brain Club possible. So, so um, before we talk about internalized ableism, we got to talk about ableism first. So ableism, um, uh, one of the many interrelated isms, is the discriminatory belief that it is superior to be able. This may be intentional or unintentional, um, but this is really important to name because it's very common, um, just like so many of the other isms. And whenever we are in a space of thinking that it is superior, that, 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 that any group of people is superior to another group of people, um, this is not what leads to a socially just inclusive community, which is what we are, of course, striving for. And often ableism, um, neurodiversity, access, ableism, these topics are, are often all, all missing um, from the larger conversations. So internalized ableism is when those messages are internalized um, by the person. So this shows up in many different ways. And rather than my, give you, my giving you some examples, um, let's hear from our community. Um, so uh, what, what happens um, is that when people grow up being shoved into containers that don't work for them, this, this takes a toll on someone's self-concept, self-esteem, the way they talk to themselves, the way they believe what's possible or expect for their own lives. And yet what we know is that um, uh, just as with vis visible disabilities, um, uh, the issue is lack of access. There may be things that are hard about a wide range of disabilities, but the amount of disability that someone experiences is relative to the barriers in the world. And so as it relates to invisible disability, it's the same exact thing. Um, uh, uh, today, um, I had a very hard time, quote, performing at work. Um, I gave a presentation on teams and the, the, the motor plan of teams is just such a mismatch to my brain. Um, and now I have that lens where it's like, even a year ago, even, I think I would have given myself, a, 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 it would have been a very different self-talk or self-narrative um, that, 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 that came about. The idea of, 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 of when something happens, the automatic narrative to blame oneself um, is just so common and it's, 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 it's bred by the circumstances of our culture in a lot of, in a lot of regard. So, um, let's hear from our community members. We're first gonna, um, uh, we, we are uh, thrilled to welcome Megan Thomas, a uh, member of our community advisory board and our new project coordinator of our new employment support program for our patients. So I'm going to read you some quotes from Megan, and then we'll listen to um, uh, uh, some additional community members on video. Internalized ableism 
is a breeding ground for a mess of negative emotions, including shame and judgment. It can become very easy to gaslight yourself into a spiral, shut down, down, melt down, down. I become frustrated with myself for just not being able to do the thing, not admitting to myself or others that I have needs and may require accommodation. There's already a ton, a ton of uh, uh, reaction in the chat about this is this is resonating. I think we're going to see a lot of that tonight. Things that have been, uh, we're going to actually, we're going to come back to things that have been helpful at the end, actually. Let's, uh, let's watch. Because that's the idea. The idea is that we're going to hear, hear from other people's experiences. I think you will hear a lot of, um, similarities, a lot of themes popping out, um, and that we, well, I'm, I'm hoping that we all leave here tonight with ideas around what can help, what can help with this journey of unpacking. So with that, um, David, David, go for it. For it. So we're doing this panel to talk about um, how internalized ableism affects people throughout their lives. What do you think about that? A uh, lot of thoughts uh, as someone who's autistic and also a therapist. Uh, but the big part is I find it to be like very important for folks to know that they're autistic, neurodivergent or whatever you know language they want to use for it because it is such a big part of shame reduction. And that is so true across like any identity that when we are not able to embrace and acknowledge like all parts of our identity, it creates so much shame and guilt and inaccessibility to things. And it's just exhausting. And it's already exhausting enough to be uh, autistic, uh, ADHD in this world that adding the exhaustion of shame is, is unnecessary like you know in the social world uh it, i'm just always astonished there are people that move so easily in the social world and they don't have to do the math you know they are um they 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 just uh they move intuitively and i've got to figure everything out and it's the same exact thing i uh you know Yes, can I do it? Yes, have I been able to organize a professional life and 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 do it? But it comes at a cost of exhaustion that sometimes leads me to like just not try to do things. And and I would say it's the same thing in my analogy. It's invisible. You can't see the extra effort or the fact that, you know, my professional life it would, could incite such overwhelming anxiety, I couldn't sleep and so forth. I'd get up, I would go back at it, but at a certain point, the, the, just the, the sheer exhaustion in navigating some aspects of the world uh, is such that it might lead me to decide not to do things. A lot of people have like told me I can't do a lot of, a lot of things. So, I've always like thought that I couldn't. And so like, I wouldn't like, even, even if I try, even if I wanted to, I wouldn't try. I think that internalized ableism has been for me, what I named it um, was self negative talk. And so I have been working really hard to change those words. Um, but now understanding that it's actually, I mean, it's the same thing, but it's, directed in a different direction, I think. I, I think it's interesting because like negative self-talk is such, um, it's like this, it creeps up, up on you. It's like, it's like something happens and your like automatic response connects to these like core beliefs. When I was looking at the prompts, uh, especially the one about like stepping into learning and in internal, unlearning internalized ableism, my biggest thing is like you have to unlearn the other stuff too. You have to look at the other stuff too because it is all connected. Um, and honestly, I think ableism, what I've noticed watching other people and in my own journey of unlearning different things is that the two things that tend to come last are ableism and fat phobia. It has always seemed to me 
that those isms, like there are a lot of people who don't know that they are isms. Yeah. Like, well, of course I would not want to be disabled. Did you just say that out loud? You, right, you, yeah. You, you said that out loud. It's not even you thought it and didn't say it. You said it out loud because you don't think there's anything wrong with what just came out of your mouth. I grew up, up in, a, in a time where it was like really common for people to very openly mock disabled folk. You know, it was very common for people to say like that person, you know, rides the short bus or like make fun of like so and so or use the R word and stuff like that. And it was like really common. And as someone who was like relentlessly bullied for so many other things that I would later realize were just autistic traits, just like no one knew that they were. Uh, I didn't need the label of being <laughs> autistic, ADHD or anything. I was already getting enough uh, flack in all quarters without that label. Uh, it also led to a lot of coldness because I was struggling so much in so many ways. My only way to deal with that was to just become harder as a person and colder and to like pull away, which led to me not having a lot of compassion for other folks, especially as like a teenager, because like, if I'm, if I'm so, so hard, hard to do this thing, why can't you work as just as hard as me? I found that like, as I started to embrace my own needs as an autistic person, uh, that being compassionate towards other people didn't feel like a demand. It felt like something I could like genuinely be because up until that point, my compassion felt like a thing that was performed out of the sake of making other people comfortable because it was really hard to understand other people's struggle because I was putting myself in so much pain and discomfort regularly. And so it created just a lot of resentment towards other people. In high school, something just changed in me where when somebody when a um a school board attendant a superintendent told me told my IEP meeting that I was too the R word um to graduate and that I should I just, just uh, uh, quit school because he doesn't see me going anywhere in life and i was just like i heard that and i was just like um i said some explicit <laughs> and i flipped my chair and i left the room when you are putting 10 times as much energy into doing things that would ap otherwise appear to be simple navigations of the social world um it has an effect on you and and it, and that's an effect that is independent of any um a question of internalized ableism now you know the the uh internalized ableism that arises is that you know when you have difficulty in social situations and the person who you're talking with begins to look over your shoulder suddenly and wonder wonder whether there's somebody else that would be a little easier to talk with or a little commu to communicate with probably um you know they don't intend to be hurtful but the accumulation in the individual autistic person's experience of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these types of things does lead you with, uh, in some subtle, almost unconscious way to begin to believe that you're broken. I always felt broken and misunderstood in many aspects of my life. Normally trying to describe to people how I felt turned into me pointing a finger and being too sensitive. I didn't have the correct language. I had to teach myself comprehension in high school and later on in life, up to today, to understand others and to try to fit in and blend in. I'd go from one relationship to another, romantic or platonic, throughout my life. Much of what you just said resonates with me deeply. Um, so, so you've been, been in, 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 in like, like arriving at this understanding of how this has played out. Like, I imagine you didn't just be like, do do do. Now I understand it, right? So, like, how did, can you can you share I, uh, about what what that's been like? Like the process of yeah. unpacking that. Yeah, it was. It was the first part of like kind of getting through the initial uh, kind of like shame response of being like, I might be autistic. 
I might be. I remember watching like a bunch of videos on TikTok and like they they like really resonated super deeply with things that I just didn't talk to people about that I was just like this everyone was struggling this way so like but no one talks about it and I was like oh oh everyone doesn't struggle with this I was like the 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 differences in the way that your brain processes experiences and does things um it, it exists independent of that but it also contributes to that so i think that there's a distinction to be made between between um those two things that it would probably be in a in a ideal world it probably be possible to experience those differences without them um morphing into something that's self-destructive as i started grad school in 2021 so the pandemic was raging i mean it still is but um people acknowledged that it was raging then <laughs> um the pandemic was raging i was newly diagnosed with adhd and i was also newly diagnosed with EDS. Or actually, at this point, I hadn't even been diagnosed with EDS. I just had a lot of pain and no one knew what it was. Um, so I learned really quickly that I had to advocate for myself and I had to stand up for myself because no one else would. Um, and watching, I feel, like, I feel like that's when I really started to get cued in to all of the ableism, especially in academia. Like, it's horrible. But even just the everyday ableism of when UVM lowered their mask mandate. Um, and we had like, I guess it's great that in each class, the professors are like, let's have a conversation and decide this together. Like in some ways, great. In other ways, as, as this would be expected to go, I, the disabled person, had to speak up and identify myself as disabled and immunocompromised to get my classmates to care. I look back at it now and I realize that actually maybe I've been doing it pretty much all my life, showing that people I can do it. Because like, if I look at it, like I wasn't supposed to live when I was born and I'm 37. I wasn't supposed to walk, walk, I walk, I walk my dog every day. I wasn't supposed to talk and now you really can't shut me up. Um, <laughs> you, you know, like I wasn't supposed to graduate high school. I got um, two associates and in December I'll be graduating with my bachelor's degree. Um, so like the internalized ableism is really just me being scared to do it like scared of when somebody's like i don't think that you can do this and be me being like oh what if i can't what if i fail like that's like the, the the very like the scariest part for me is like failing um like even in school what i'm doing in school if i get anything below a 95 i feel like i'm failing perfectionist drive to like do the thing and show the people and prove like that like that is, that is. I think you're I think you're so insightful in saying that that's how you are still manifesting internalized ableism because the perfectionism will allow you to let go of that whereas lack of perfection will will not allow you to let go of that story that doesn't that, that's not true yes and that is an internalized ableism thing that has stayed with me and is still kind of with me Mm -hmm. That, like, I want to be good at my job. Mm -hmm. I want to do everything my job says I am supposed to do. And I want to do it efficiently and quickly. And I want to fulfill every part of it. Um, and my supervisor is actually the one who was like, Aspen, slow down. You are putting too much pressure on yourself. And I think that's where things can get tricky for me is, like, it's not even the system putting undue pressure on me. It's me putting undue pressure on me because I, and I think this is probably like an autism, like trauma thing. Um, not like in it, not like an innate, 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 innate autism innate thing as much of a, like, we have to prove that we're good. Yeah. Um, and this drive and need to like meet all the criteria and meet all the goals so that we prove that we are worth having around. Um, <laughs> 
And so I like want to be the good worker and I want to get the stuff done. And I'm also just like, these are the rules and you, you need to follow the rules. <laughs> um, and other people are like, these rules are ridiculous and you're, they're not achievable. Don't kill yourself trying to achieve them. Because all the isms are, are connected. Like the, the, the perfectionism that is also part of white supremacy. Like it's, it's internalized ableism is such that you were told you had to participate in that you had to mm -hmm. otherwise you have no value yep and i think the individualism too of like being disabled, being disabled so so strongly connects me. me to the need for other people um but i i feel like i have to recognize that other people are not connected to that need um, and still feel like I have to choose carefully who, when, and how I ask for help. Um, and be like, well, I just asked them for help. And so I can't ask them again. It's like some things are internalized ableism. Some things are just like hard. Some things are just hard. Exactly. And it's that, it's that hard piece that, that um, I thought would be worthwhile talking about or you know, and I was thinking about, you know, I, I looked at the that email I sent you and I I was thinking about, uh, you know, an analogy. And um, so I, I thought about, let's say I drove into the parking lot at a mall or a store or what have you, and I had a, a handicap tag, you know, that, uh, on my car. And I pulled up and parked, parked in a parking place that was close to the building. And I got out of the car and um, I looked healthy. And then, you know, that might, in, you know, invite curiosity, it might invite judgment, but uh, I walk in, do my thing, and, but I, you know, you're a doctor, you might be able to tell me any number of conditions that would, uh, would result in this, you know, whether it be COPD or chronic fatigue or who knows what, that, um, but that would create this sort of a situation. And if I was compelled to park at some distance from the building, you know, the fact that it takes me 10 times as much effort to cover that ground, well, I might be able to do it, just as I might be able to climb a flight of stairs. But maybe it, the the enormous effort involved in doing so would lead me to not, to isolate, to not do it. And that's what I'm talking about with the respect, respect the added effort that nobody can see to do certain things. So if we could, if we could separate this, um, cause I'm, I'm interested in, in, in your journey of arriving at what you just said in where you have, have amassed this collection of experiences where you are quote able to do the thing, but at great cost. And because it's an invisible disability, no one sees and they expect things and they don't see what goes on behind the scenes to make that so, whether that be socially or executive function or or whatever. When you recognize that, how how does that recognition change your experience, if at all? <laughs> well, you know, sometimes you're caught in a conundrum because you know if you do if you take actions to, to um, for one of a better word, protect yourself from that, then you can deny yourself ex human experiences, which have value, you know? And so it's a conundrum, you know? So you can re respond to that and remove yourself from the situation or do other things to ameliorate it or talk to people and say, this is what I'm experiencing. That all those things bear some cost. Or on the other hand, you can you can ignore it and, and just power through. I'm really good at powering through, but that's what what I've what I've come to realize recently is that the the way that I've powered through in my life is by is through dissociation. Yeah, and by same. Learning the, the the you know developing a really robust capacity to um to tune out my own body and to tune out my own reactions, and those reactions don't go away; they get subsumed. But they just emerge, you know, that's where you begin to feel crazy, crazy. you begin to feel dysphoric, you begin to feel, um, you know, 
broken because you, yes, you can power through, but powering through comes at, 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 at some really, really, really significant costs. You talk yeah. about this with your child? I do. What do you yeah, say? I let him know about my youth and um, a lot of unintentional, you know, um, people say things. And it's a lot of unlearning that you have been trying to really um, put awareness, you know, for everybody out there. But, you know, a lot of people don't realize they're doing this. The awareness is the biggest part. Right. Yeah. A awareness of like the ways in which your culture is impacting the things that bear out in communication. And when, when my seven-year-old makes a comment like, oh, well, that's easy. I'm, <laughs> I'm very, um, intentional about it. Well, it's, well, it's easy for you. Right. Um, right. Cause I, and then, and then I'll, and I'll, and, 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 and I, I try to be paired cause we, you know, we certainly want to be aware of strengths and plan a life based on those strengths, but I don't mm -hmm. want anybody um, thinking that right. their brain is the default brain. I experience disability or I am disabled by my environment. Yeah. Um, I have, um, but I don't think I even entertained that word at all as being relevant for me. Probably not so like maybe a year ago, and it was like my physical health conditions where like that because and, and it goes back to kindergarten being you being introduced to the word disabled then i spend a lot of time going like okay so this is also happening when i'm having a lot of health stuff and like the connection to the health things and i started doing research i was like so let's look into like the history of disability in the united states because like that's like that's the kind of person i am so like i i i listened to the audiobook of like a history of of like the a disabled history of the united states to get kind of like this foundational knowledge and i was like okay that is really helpful context for understanding it then i started reading books like uh by like different disabled activists and stuff i started following people like crutches and spice on TikTok and like listening to these like different things and being like okay all right so like this is how ableism is showing up in my life and reading the works of uh casey davis and like how to keep house while drowning and realizing like all of these different way things are just showing up in my life and how do i work on this and building um, neurodivergent disabled community where it became really normalized like this idea like you're allowed to rest and like people just really normalizing the idea of rest really normalizing the idea of accommodating and not shaming when someone like i just can't can't do this thing right now can i uh, realize that it's okay to stick up for myself in ways that like i would be like to Cause I used to be, I used to be ashamed and like, just really quiet. And I still, if, if I, if I'm having a hard time with something and I go to a doctor and I'm like, I need, I feel like this is what I need. And they're like, no, that's not what you need. It's not, that's not it. And like, I say it again, like I say it a second time and they still like push me aside. I stop. I stop and I don't, I don't, I'm like, okay, like surrender. And um, I, I think I do that just because of, I don't, I don't like confrontation at all. And um, I think, I think that, but with this case manager that I had, she, she wouldn't, she wouldn't give up. She was like, no, 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 no. Listen to what she's saying. Like, that's amazing right so you got it was you got this model of like you know th this you 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 can't you don't um it doesn't need to be a confrontation it can be assertive and so you got to see that but you know the thing is about about backing off when you say something twice and then they, it, it's it's also like triaging your energy right because if this is clearly someone who like doesn't get it doesn't get you is not open and I could see where you might say, well, I'm going to save my spoons. Yeah. So as, as people are on this journey of self-discovery mm -hmm. and like, so, so like, first up, they learn, they, they learn, first off, they learn that internalized ableism is a thing, 
right? Mm -hmm. So, and then you can match that pattern, you know, one of, one of our many strengths is pattern matching, right? So you can match the pattern of there I go again, but that doesn't make it go away necessarily. Do you, do you have any advice, advice for someone who like knows that internalized ableism is playing a role in their life, mm -hmm. but, but they can't seem to get, uh, get it out of its, out of their way? Uh, well, the fact that they're noticing it is actually a huge first step because you can't change something until you've noticed the thing and you may spend a long time in that noticing. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, you also probably before you can start implementing it, you're going to want to spend time building compassion for yourself. You know, we call it, when we talk about in like trauma work, we talk about this idea of like, we're trying to build someone up to be able to be their own compassionate witness. And so if all you can do is at this point is notice and build compassion for yourself as a human, it's going to make it that much easier to implement the action eventually. And the other part is like surrounding yourself by other people who can model that for you. So that when you're like, ah, oh, like, I, like I'm struggling with this thing and I'm not feeling good, having people literally kind of like lovingly go like, then take the, take day, the day off. So number one, which is like the most important to me, but I see you, I hear you. I notice you when I go to the store, one of my clients, a child, an adult, you are not alone. This sounds somewhat corny, but I mean it. Sometimes I'll say hi to you. Other times I may have a full conversation and make you laugh and show you kindness. Totally not something natural for me, something I learned that helps not only me, but other people who may need some kindness. And it can go both ways. Um, number two, patience, self-forgiveness, and forgiveness to others from their unintentional acts or lack of empathy. You know, because people people don't talk about this, right? So um, before a couple of years ago, I never met anyone who talked about any of this. And when something happens that doesn't go well, whether that be socially or, you know, cognitively or, you know, I mean, everything's cognitive, like, you know, something, something doesn't go well that relates to something that is hard for me. Um, um, I previously like you know it's 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 that narrative of like what the hell's wrong with me why can't i just do the thing everybody else is doing the thing right so so there is a part of that that includes the belief that it would be better to be able to do the thing and for me that part of internalized ableism is still there and it creeps up all the time I like to think it's not there, but it is there. There are things that I wish I were able to do easily because it yep. would be easier for me, right? And so that's that's the part. Who would guess? Who would guess what you just said? You know, I mean, me, I've had a very distinguished career as an educator. Who would guess? You know, um, <laughs> that's... Uh, that which is part of the problem where like i remember the first time that i it was it, i think it was the day i got my, I got my diagnosis, diagnosis i then like went to work like i told a physician at the hospital who i was pretty close with and the response was what you just said it was oh wow i never could have told and yeah. i was just so deeply offended by that and then, like, I mean, a million, like, I've had a million of those since then, right? So it, it's, 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 it's based on the belief that, quote, you'd be able to tell, and that being able to tell would reflect that there was something, like, not good about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the problem is, is that, uh, when you, when it can't be seen, it can result in behavioral things which can be highly probably problematic. You know, when you become, when I became so dysphoric that I wrecked a truck, you know, it's like, uh, it, you know, then these things come out of nowhere. Right. Yeah, where it's like nothing comes out, no, but nothing really comes out of nowhere. It's this, it's like what you said earlier about, you know, you, you, you get to a place where the things in the world are impacting everything. Um, well, in the, in the education field, you know, we talk about students and the, the analogy that we use is a shaken soda can. Yes. Okay. And so the a student comes into your class 
comes in, sits down quietly. I mean, I've had this happen to me. And then uh, suddenly there's a world-class meltdown where you're evacuating the other students from the classroom while this kid destroys everything. I mean, I've had this experience. Shaken soda can. You said some, yeah. and it was completely innocent. I said, would say something like, you know, no, you had your turn doing that in the last class. And all of a sudden, all you know, all your excluders loose. loose. Yeah. 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 Like the shaken soda can. The soda can is sitting there. You can't tell that it's been shaken. But when you pop the top off, there's, there's soda all over the place. You know, I think just making people aware that, like, if you call me sensitive, yeah, I'm sensitive and it's not negative. Like, it's OK that I'm sensitive and I can cry if I need to let everything go. But calling me sensitive in the way that you're saying it is a negative, like you're shaming me and I don't need to be shamed for feeling this way. Um, instead, why don't you comfort me and give me empathy? You know, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to fix it, but maybe try to understand the situation. So I'm really trying like with my employees and every single person I meet. I mean, I just, I tell people my access needs. I tell people I'm autistic and um, have ADHD right away. And then I tell them this is how I work. And, you know, it really helps people work with me. Is, is the issue of hugging. Now we're Americans, you know, like everybody hugs, everybody hugs each other. I think the European thing is really weird. But, um, I, you know, I've gotten to the point where, you know, I'm just not comfortable, you know, I'm just kind of sick of the discomfort. And now I'm sort of stuck in this place of like, if I don't hug people, I'm going to look cold and unfriendly. But if I do, it comes at personal cost because I've got all this stuff going on in my brain about what, you know, should I hug this person? Should I not? Is this appropriate? Is this not? I just am doing all this math. I'm doing all this math. A friend of mine came to our house, came to a gathering at the end. She said to me, um, may I hug you? Would you like a hug? And of course, if somebody says that to me, I'll, I'll most often say yes, because I like affection as much as anybody else. But the wonderful thing about that accommodation, if you will, is it completely relieved me of the need to do the math, you know? And and so all of these, these things that go on in my brain uh, didn't have to go on for the simple courtesy that this person extended to me. So oh, it's the idea of like, especially for people who are expected to always be caretaking, always be doing things, always succeeding, which so often, and I think for the core of her audience and her approach is like black femmes or femmes of color, but it is also so applicable to disabled people of all genders, expressions, um, races, everything like that, because it's the idea that just allowing ourselves to rest and not force ourselves to be productive and like subscribe to this capitalist mindset of productivity is a form of resistance. Um, and yeah, I think that like blew my mind for me to just like, it helped me alleviate so much of my guilt about not doing all the things all the time, um, especially as an activist. Um, and as someone who wants to feel involved in the community, community, like, like rest is an act of resistance, not pushing yourself to burnout is an act of resistance. I mean, it's interesting, um, uh, in, in, we, sh we shared in the chat during Brain Club, um, uh, the, the 2021 article about the characteristics of white supremacy culture. And I remember the first time I read that a few years ago, and I was like, oh oh okay and like once mm -hmm. you learn it you can't unlearn it and so when you recognize that like pressure to not rest is in fact you're a pawn of the system and like you are perpetuating white supremacy culture by like allowing yourself to be caught up in it like damn straight i'm gonna resist that yep yeah it was this article that absolutely blew my mind that was all about every other maybe not every other but most other like ism in the world is rooted in and perpetuated with ableism so, so send me that yeah it's amazing and so kind of the examples it gave are like the idea that like women and people of colors color didn't deserve rights because they weren't as smart as white men they were less evolved than white men like all of that is ableism and so ableism was used to perpetuate other types of oppression. 
educating myself on the history of the struggle, educating myself on other people's lived experiences, and then also just like being in community. Helping connect others to a community that I have found myself embracing is life-changing and helping to spread awareness. Some advice that I have for someone that's struggling with internalizing ableism is um, believe in yourself and try to like, like do, do um, um, I like to do SMART goals. And then number four is really important. Um, collaborating with many other minds to bring awareness to schools, employers, healthcare, mental health entities, and policy holders of the whole body aspect of living and having a fulfilling life. I do think maybe the most useful thing is, is if people, if we could educate ourselves about that some of these behaviors don't mean that the person doesn't like it, but that they're just having a, they have some, some uh some struggles with it uh and to just kind of let that go um you know uh to the extent it would take a long time i mean i think people to overcome the the thousand times when somebody's looked past you to find somebody a little easier to talk with it's gonna it take it's gonna take when when that's become your normal and that's become the thing that you've expected, it's going to take quite a few experiences to begin to counteract that. I don't even know if that's a practical thing. I really don't, you know. Um, but uh, but being conscious and being aware maybe can start to chip away at that. It's, it's I think when 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 folks are so dysregulated and so traumatized and so like I don't know, there's just so many people who have not have the experience of feeling mm -hmm. safe showing up authentically in community. So like they they don't even like the, just the idea that like you'd come and have a community and learn about this stuff or unlearn about this stuff together. And like, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to do that? <laughs> like other people, they suck. Um, what do you what do you say to someone who ha that's been their lived experience? I get it. Um, I would say like one of the things I kind of like asked myself was like it's do do people suck or does society suck and those are two very separate things and more often than not what people hate is like society and culture and how it interacts with us and the demands and places it places upon us because most people will say well you know I like this person or I like that person and what they don't like is just like everything else that's on top of it and so stop viewing community as society that's okay you have just exploded my brain i don't even know what to do i think that's about the most profound thing that i have heard in you know weeks if not months like holy <laughs> crap that needs to be on a t-shirt or something that's amazing that it's it's one of those things where it's like most people don't hate people most people want to be near people even like clients that i work with who have experienced the most intense trauma at the hands of other people desperately want community and they want connection and they want to feel seen. What they don't want is to feel shame and judgment. And that's a universal human experience. No one wants to feel shame and judgment. And so like, if you have people coming together with that understanding that we're not there to perpetuate the demands of society, that we're here to build something where we just get to be us, then you're not, you're not engaging with society. You're engaging with your community. And those are two very different things. With respect to, you know, the all brains belong community, you know, it, the internalized ableism for me takes the form of like, okay, when is the other shoe going to drop? You know, you understand so, what I mean? So, so, so like in that, like, yeah, someone's going to like tell you you don't belong. Is that like, that, or, that or yeah, that, yeah, like when is, when is it going to be, when, when, when is the thing that I've always experienced going to happen? You know, uh, so, you know, and so I keep coming back and I keep coming back and, you know, and, and having um, this sort of experience of sort of radical acceptance, I think has the potential to slowly untangle that thing, but it, it's, it's, it's slow and it's not, it's not very easy, you know. Thank you for sharing that. And you're not the only one who has shared, shared, shared that by any means. Yeah. And I think almost the, um, for many people, I don't know if this is how it is for you, um, 
like the idea of like this is what social like socializing would like look what like what 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 community connection would look like and like I don't know how to do that thing and this doesn't look really even sure it feels like that thing that I thought that I was working towards so this thing I'm like working my way towards something but like this is the thing this is the thing you show up and people are excited to see you and we say thank you so much for coming um well, like how can we make this experience better for you and like if every single time is that I don't know isn't that isn't that community connection I think one be patient with yourself and kind to yourself and I think this kind of ties into that which is like don't use on learning internalized ableism as another reason to be ableist toward yourself. Um, don't you don't beat yourself, beat yourself up, up for like, for like not, not immediately unlearning all the ableism and not immediately being like whatever your version of liberated from ableism is. Um, when you have an ableist thought, it's not helpful to beat yourself up about it it's helpful to notice it um and keep going and i think it's so easy to just get caught in this cycle of like i'm gonna unlearn these things whether it's ableism or anything else and then beat ourselves up for not immediately being the perfect person having unlearned all of it and having none of it come out in our words or actions ever like having people who are willing to entertain the idea of a kinder world is also a really big thing. The other thing that I think is really important is internalized ableism, all the isms are just at the end of the day related to white supremacy culture and, and capitalist culture. culture. And if you want to dismantle that, you're dismantling all of them. You can't just dismantle one. And so your commitment to dismantling your internalized ableism means like you really ought to be open to dismantling all of those other things because otherwise they're gonna sneak in there in really sneaky, sneaky ways and like fuel that internalized ableism. Because if you're still buying into the idea that you're like capitalism is the way to be and like you have to put out and be productive, no amount of self-love and compassion is going to work to like overcome that. In the same way that like if you hold any belief that some people are better than or more worthy than even on like a subconscious level it's going to make it really hard for you to extend that kindness to yourself and to like deconstruct that shame and so doing this work is really deep work and very healing on a lot of different levels you can't just do one of them you kind of got to do all of them and that doesn't mean you have to start with all of them just like just like recognizing like you're going to be questioning a lot of things and that's what makes identity formation like so hard is you're going to find yourself deconstructing so many things so it's not a race this is a marathon this is something you're going to do over time i have been deeply entrenched in like deconstructing my own connection to white supremacy work since i was like in high school like I've been doing that since then and every day there's still more that I find out and I'm like geez okay and so being kind to yourself around that because you're going to be like I got this ableism thing on on lock and you'll find something it's okay we all do we you know it's like a fish being like how do you know you're in water kind of situation so you're gonna find it constantly so just being kind about that process Oh, such wisdom, like so much wisdom that you have just imparted to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to add before I shut off the recording? Um, in, I, like, the thing that I, like, that I like to remind folks is taking care of yourself and meeting your needs is a radical act. Like that is in a world that tells you to not do that, to suffer, to like, put yourself in painful situations and that that's somehow virtuous um, when that is a morally neutral act just like taking care of yourself is a morally neutral act um, choosing to fight against that system is a radical act and is sometimes the most radical thing we can do even more radical than showing up to a protest calling your senators and writing in because you're actively fighting against a culture that glorifies that harm being caused so know that when you're doing that, you are fighting against systems of oppression. You're fighting to make the world a better and kinder place when you prioritize your care. Holy cow. Yes. Amen to all of that.
Wow. So thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists, Britt Broussard, Simone Arnold, Aspen Cupper, Steve Owens, Summer Stelter, and Megan Thomas, um, most of whom are with us here today. So um, that this, 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 um, you know, I, I, I think one of the things about Brain Club, right, is the, the, the whole idea that we as individuals, myself included, become more familiar with our own experience when we hear our experiences reflected back to us through other people's stories. Like that's, that's how this works here. And we could not do that um, without, without our panelists. Um, so so um, uh, uh, these six panelists, in addition to all the other folks who are part of our community right now, part of our audience right now that have been panelists before, we are deeply, deeply, deeply grateful to you for sharing, sharing your expertise. Huh. So I wanna wrap us up um, with some text quotes um, from Megan. Things that have been helpful. R removing lazy from my vocabulary. I am not, nor have I ever been lazy. Try to remember to give yourself some grace. Finding safe sounding boards, both formal, that be medical team, therapist, et cetera, and informal, friends and family supports. And know it's going to take some time. You're gonna mess up and it's going to be okay. And so uh, with that, um, thank you all so much for being part of our community, being, being with us tonight. We're going to continue this unpacking journey next week. Um, we're going to look at um, the invalidation experiences during healthcare um, and how that impacts someone's way of being in the world. And so uh, with that, we I hope you have a good week and we'll see you next Tuesday.